Hey guys, in this edition of Hard to Believe It Happened, we're going back to June 11th, 1955. This is the prestigious 24-hour race at the Le Mans race track, known to be the most grueling race in the world. All the top manufacturers have made the annual trip to northern France. Ferrari, Jaguar, and Mercedes-Benz each have new models for this day, which is expected to be the fastest Le Mans in history. 300,000 fans have eagerly packed in for the 4 p.m. event. The atmosphere is light and celebratory and was considered the event of the year. Two hours into the race, the drivers are delivering. The top two jockey back and forth, continually breaking a lap record, reaching speeds of 190 miles per hour. Coming to the end of lap 35, suddenly the mood would change, and this day would go down as the worst tragedy in motorsports history. 24 Hours of Le Mans has been held annually since 1923 near the town of Le Mans, France. As the name suggests, it's a 24-hour race, with the winner being whoever completes the most distance, rather than having the fastest time. A few people have attempted to complete the entire race solo, but it's typically always been at least two drivers alternating. The main aspect that makes Le Mans so grueling is the course itself. Most races are held on private tracks, which are well-maintained and consistent. Le Mans, on the other hand, has long stretches of what are normally public roads, making the track conditions unpredictable year to year. The original intention of the race was to make manufacturers focus on fuel efficient, sporty, yet reliable cars, rather than simply having the fastest machines. Many of the technological innovations designed for Le Mans have trickled down and been incorporated into consumer cars. By 1955, there had been considerable innovations to automobiles, but the track had largely been unchanged. There were no barriers between the pit stops and the actual race, and only a four-foot dirt embankment between the track and spectators. During the first race in 1923, automobiles traveled at top speeds of 60 miles per hour. By 1955, they were topping out at 180 miles per hour. Yet, the car still had no seat belts, with drivers saying they preferred to be thrown clear in a collision rather than being crushed or trapped in a burning car. Heading into the 1955 race, there was a lot of excitement as Ferrari, Jaguar, and Mercedes-Benz each recently won races on the circuit but Le Mans was expected to be a contest between Jaguar of England and Mercedes of Germany. Close to 300,000 spectators are in attendance. The drivers stand opposite their cars on the track. The classic Le Mans start is a sprint start. Finally, at 4 p.m. on June 11th, the French flag is dropped. The drivers run across the track, enter the automobiles, and go. As you can see, the standing start is a cluster of chaos, which would often lead to violent crashes. Approaching lap 35, the Ferraris were having issues and had already fallen to the middle of the pack, leaving Mike Hawthorne the Jaguar battling Juan Manuel Fangio of Mercedes for the lead. Both teams knew that Mercedes had the optimal car, and so Jaguar, feeling they had a more reliable vehicle, decided to run the race as hard as they could for as long as they could with the hopes of Mercedes breaking down. The intensity of the race in the first two hours supposedly caused Hawthorne and the Jaguar to either miss or ignore calls to do a pit stop as he looked to stay in front. Finally, at 6.26 p.m., at the end of lap 35, Hawthorne decided to enter the pit, which sets off events leading to the devastating crash. This is where we'll look at the images, some of which are gruesome and hard to watch. So if that's something you don't want to see, please feel free to end the video here. Mike Hawthorne, the leader in the Jaguar, is getting close to the pit area as he approaches driver Lance Macklin, who he will lap. Macklin moves over to the right to let him pass. But after Hawthorne makes the move, he suddenly decides to cut right and brakes very hard to enter his pit area. Macklin is startled and not having the same advanced disc brakes as a Jaguar, leads him to move to the right, kicking up dirt, before veering towards the center of the track. As devastating as the crash ends up being, only two cars are involved. As Macklin cut towards the middle of the track, Pierre Levey, another Mercedes-Benz driver, was approaching at 150 miles per hour. Macklin's car acted as a ramp for Levey which catapulted the Mercedes towards spectators. Rolling end over end for 85 yards. The heaviest components of the car, the engine, radiator, and front suspension, acted as cannonballs and were hurled into the spectators for over 100 yards, crushing all in their path. The hood of the car also became detached, decapitating tightly jammed spectators. Besides those who saw the actual crash, most of the 300,000 oblivious, and the race authorities decided to keep the race going with no announcement of the accident. This sounds unbelievable, but their justification does make sense, 
arguing that they didn't want to call the race, causing the 300,000 spectators to panic and flood the streets, which would have blocked emergency crews from reaching victims. The car itself finally slammed into a concrete structure and disintegrated, at which point the fuel tank exploded. Mercedes was built with magnesium metal, but the difference in temperature caused the metal to burst into white hot flames, showering the tracking crowd with magnesium embers. On top of that, rescue workers were unfamiliar with magnesium fires toward water, which greatly intensified the fire. The result was a car burning on the side of the track for several hours. Eventually, news of the accident began to reach the press. 58 men, 15 women, and 6 children were reported dead. That number would grow to 84 casualties, with 170 more sustaining injuries. Although Mercedes-Benz driver Pierre Levet was dead, Mercedes reluctantly stayed in the race. Levet's co-driver was American John Fitch, who was at the pits waiting to take over, standing with Levet's wife. They both saw the entire catastrophe unfold, with Levet's lifeless body in full view on the pavement, causing his wife to be inconsolable. Fitch urged Mercedes-Benz, who was leading comfortably, to withdraw the other two vehicles from the race. Mercedes finally did so after considering the public relations disaster. They didn't want the optics of a German victory over an English rival on French soil, only 10 years removed from World War II. At 1.45 a.m., nearly eight hours after the crash and with many spectators gone, Mercedes quietly called in their cars, packed up, and were gone by the morning. The Mercedes team would finish out the year but then withdrew from motorsport racing for over 30 years. Jaguar had decided not to withdraw all true competition out of the race. Mike Hawthorne would go on to win by an easy margin of five laps. Three, two, one. Les 24 heures du Mans sont terminées. Soon celebration by Hawthorne made it seem as if he didn't know an accident had occurred. Jaguar and Hawthorne received a lot of pushback for the reaction after the race. One French magazine sarcastically printed this image with the caption, Cheers, Monsieur Hawthorne. After the race, there was a lot of finger pointing as to who had been responsible for the wreck. Some drivers blamed Hawthorne for his late and aggressive attempt to enter the pits. Hawthorne wrote an autobiography three years later, taking no accountability for the accident and seemingly blaming the lack of skill of drivers behind him for the crash. Blame was also thrown at Mercedes for the violence of the fire, with the media speculating that they had tampered with the fuel with an explosive additive. Eventually, an 18-month inquiry exonerated all drivers of any air ruling it a terrible racing tragedy. The Le Mans course would undergo extensive track improvements and infrastructure changes designed to improve driver and spectator safety. John Fitch, the co-driver of Pierre Leve, who tragically passed away at Le Mans, became a major safety advocate and eventually designed what are known as Fitch Barrels, which have saved thousands of lives on a highway. Because of this tragedy, racing would forever be changed for the better, but that certainly doesn't mean that it's become safe. Mercedes eventually returned to motorsport racing in 1997, and in 1999 decided to go back, back to the, the cars, But this wouldn't be the end of crashes go. for the team. Oh my god, oh my god, the Mercedes has taken off. Thank you guys for watching. Now that you're informed, we'd love your feedback on this video, as well as content ideas for other videos. If you enjoyed what you saw, please like and subscribe, and make sure to check back to Doc Rounds for more deep dives. By the way, the driver, Peter Dumbreck, was fine.